the gratitude that I feel to the Rebbe of blessed memory for the extent to which I learned from him, I was uh, inspired by him, and the extent to which he, he not only deepened my emona, uh, but brought me back more fully onto the path of halacha, from which uh, when I first heard him, I had, shall I say, slightly strayed, but uh, not for long under the influence of the Rebbe. And I'm also here as an expression of Hakur Tov for all the shluchim here in New York, around America, and around the world that I have met on so many occasions for all you do. What an honor to be with Rabbi Arthur Schneier at Park East Synagogue. This is the house that Rabbi Schneier built and nurtures for so long. Uh, he, uh, in his own words, is a Kiddush Hashem. And uh, like the Rebbe, he, he not only teaches Torah here and lives it, but he brought the Torah out into the world with his uh, remarkable work uh, for um, human rights around the world. He builds bridges uh, that some people know about and some people don't know about, but they all uh, are really acts of Kiddush Hashem, Sir Rabbi Schneier. Uh, may you live to be 120. <laughs> I'm going to repeat the last line. His eye was not dimmed, nor his natural force diminished. So we know that in June of 1994, the Rebbe's Neshama, his soul, departed this earth. But here on earth, his vision, his leadership, his teaching, his effect on people is more alive today than ever before. And why is that? Because of you, the Shulchan, and all of us who are sort of fellow traveling Shulchan, as Rabbi Shtar said, because the Rebbe uh, made us uh, that way. He, in a very real sense, his eyes are not dimmed and his natural force of leadership is not uh, diminished. Each of you has picked up uh, the torch. I remember about a year after the Rebbe's passing, uh, my wife and I were in Budapest for a conference and we met the Shaliach in Budapest and uh, needless to say, he asked us for a Shabbat lunch, so how could we say no? Uh, the, by the Shulchan, the food is always very good and the company is good and the conversation is good. And I remember saying to him with some uh, trepidation. Um, Rabbi, people ask me, who's going to replace the Rebbe? And he, tell me how you think I should answer that. And he said to me, uh, no one can replace the Rebbe. No one can replace the Rebbe. But here in Budapest, I'm going to do my best to do what I think the Rebbe would want me to do. And then he started to call out the names of other shluchim I knew. And in Stanford, Connecticut, where I know you're from, Rabbi Yisrael Darren will do his best. And in Washington, where you're the senator, the other Rabbi Levi Shem Tov, uh, will, will do his best. And that is exactly what has happened, that each of you and those you've drawn to the Rebbe's vision, uh, to a love of Torah and love of fellow Jews, and, and a love of life and a desire to do mitzvot, each of you has picked up the torch and spread the light of Torah vision and Torah Judaism as the Rebbe saw it. As he said, even in the darkest places, the light of a single candle can be seen far and wide. And incidentally, it doesn't have to be in far parts of the earth. Here in uh, New York City, there are, there are places of darkness and there are people who feel as if they are surrounded within themselves with darkness or alone, the darkness of loneliness. And you and your work here light a candle for them and so many others. I mean, since the Rebbe's death, um, you have added uh, more shluchim, opened more Chabad houses, more preschool, guns, more college, 
campus centers more friendship circles on and on. It's a remarkable story and really should be studied by people who study leadership. Uh, I don't know of another example in our time, certainly, where the followers of a leader not only uh, continued the leader's work, but expanded it enormously. Uh, I looked up wondering what, what had happened. It's because the Rebbe was walking in. This was the devotion of the Rebbe's chassidim and their attentiveness, their eagerness to see what would happen, to hear him. As you know the story, for me it was a first time experience. He spoke for 20 or 25 minutes. There was singing of Zmeros, there was holding up the Lachaim. I'm pretty sure it was only grape juice, as far as I can tell. And uh, looking for the Rebbe to respond, which he did over and over again. This went on for itself 15 or 20 minutes. And then the Rebbe spoke again for 20 or 25 minutes. And this sequence went on for hours till after midnight. It was an amazing experience. It was for me a life-changing uh, experience. I had the opportunity to go back many times to a Febrengen with the Rebbe. Rabbi, Rabbi. Um, I, I exchanged some correspondence occasionally, always benefiting from his uh, wisdom. Uh, this tape, as Rabbi Shemtov said, is when I was on my way to LaGuardia Airport after I'd been elected to the Senate for the first time because I wanted to, uh, so to speak, get started on the right foot, which for me went, meant to get a bracha from the Rebbe. And he was, um, you know, I had a pretty good 24 years in the Senate and I give that bracha a good credit because I started in the right place. But every member of my family and uh, people that I didn't even know I was related to came to see the Rebbe claiming they were my relatives. Uh, every member of the family, he, he, it's like he looked into their eyes and saw, really saw their, their shama, what they were about, and gave them a perfect comment. And um, it helped me immensely. I will never forget, um, he was very generous with his words, but um, he said, don't be satisfied. Now, he said it in immediate response to us introducing Hadassah Mehard, our uh, baby daughter, who was not even born yet. But I, but I took it to be an invocation to be me about my service in the Senate. You get something done, this was the Rebbe's way, as you should him know. Don't be satisfied. Think about what's next. And I also read into it another message, which is, uh, don't be discouraged. Okay, so maybe not everything you try to do will succeed, but come back. And, and try it again. And then 24 years later, um, I announced that I wasn't gonna run for the Senate again. And um, somebody, a friend of mine in Chabad, sent me some words that I ever wrote about retirement, which I actually was to me a kind of bracha for the next stage of my life. And I quote, the idea of retirement is rooted in modern society's notion that life is composed of productive, and non-productive periods. The Rebbe disagreed with this idea, he, and he said, quote, every day of life God gives us here on earth is another day of opportunity to get something good done. And he concluded the opportunity to passively enjoy the fruits of one's labor does indeed have its time and place. It is in the world to come. Hashem, <laughs> Hashem. So um, every now and then, because I've stayed busy in my uh, post-Senate retirement years, my wife says to me, I, I thought you were supposed to be retired. And I said, yeah, but remember what the Rebbe said. <laughs> Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. <laughs> and anyway, we, uh, we are soldiers in the Rebbe's army. That is Tzibah Hashem. I remember there was a, uh, a campaign in a way in, uh, I think, the 80s. And we go forward now, guided by the prodigious and profound body of written uh, transcripts uh, and audio recordings of his wisdom uh, and teaching 
uh, to guide us. And the model we have, because we experienced it, we saw it, of his extraordinary life and leadership in the Jewish community and in the wider world. I just want to briefly share with you what I, I take from this remarkable man's life. Really, there has not been a leader. There are, we've had great leaders and great scholars and great rabbis in my lifetime, but I don't believe there's been a more effective leader of a more dynamic movement than uh, the Lubavitch Rebbe of, of blessed memory. And incidentally, um, you, Shulchan, and all of us who follow you, have kept him alive in that sense to 120. And with your help, we're going to keep him alive for 120 more years and 120 out of that. Do you agree? Amen. Amen. Okay, so the, the two lessons, the first has been referred to, which is uh, the Torah and the, and the uh, a source of Libros, the Ten Commandments, are Hashem's gift to us, and it's up to us to choose um, whether we want to accept our responsibility to live according to that wisdom. This is what the Rebbe taught us to uphold it in our lives, but really, most important of all, uh, to spread it to others, particularly beginning with our uh, fellow Jews. And um, as has been said, um, this was all in the Rebbe's vision done with a, a Chavos Yisrael, with love of one's fellow Jews. Uh, and uh, as a result, at a time in the Jewish world where there has been a lot of assimilation and loss of identity as Jews, Chabad uh, has reached out. I thought the uh, Rabbi Shai's phrase was, was beautiful. The Rebbe was the architect of Kiru, bringing people closer in. You've all reached out to the uninvolved, to the disconnected, sometimes the cynical. And the Rebbe's term lit the spark of Yiddishkeit in uh, each of those people. I will, I, and this idea of if every Jew is part of a family with us, the Rebbe preached. Uh, I will never forget somebody who I knew in New Haven who was Jewish but not at all involved in religion. And he said to me at one point that he was struck that, that this movement of Chabad Jews, who to him were ultra-Orthodox, uh, had more respect for him, even though he wasn't observant, uh, than other uh, Jews uh, who, who were observant, who he met. And in that love that he felt, they brought him in. I don't want you to think he ended up as a chassid, but he became more observant. And that's, uh, that is um, the story that's, that you've done here in New York City and throughout the world. And uh, what's happened throughout the world is remarkable. And all of us, when we travel, have benefited from it. I don't have to tell you, uh, Shulchan providing minyanim and kosher food and friendship and uh, in, in places that I, I, I had to go or ended up wanting to go far flung Munich, Dublin, Tashkent, Budapest, Chernovitz, Bangkok, and the list goes on and uh, on. Uh, uh, a few personal stories very briefly. I, I had a yurt site for my father. I was traveling with a congressional delegation uh, uh, after the attack, um, after we invaded Afghanistan and throughout the Taliban back then. And we visited other countries, uh, and we were not supposed to be in Uzbekistan the day of my father's um, yurtzeit, but the, it, it happened that the weather forced us to be. We came in the night of the yurtzeit, and I, I asked the embassy, is there a synagogue here? Oh yes, there is. Do you know if they have services tomorrow morning? Let me check. Oh yes, there's a service. So they didn't know I was coming. The embassy car took me over. There were 40 people there for Shakri. It was amazing. And a school building. And this was a Chabad in Tashkent. Perhaps you've heard me tell what's a more amazing and funnier story. I was in Munich, Germany for a conference with my friend John McCain. It happened to be in 2004. There were tremendous protests, 100,000 people protesting the war in Iraq. The block on which this conference is is surrounded by tanks and police vehicles. They separate to let our bus come in, our congressional delegation. I get out and the uh, 
uh, Marine, U.S. Marine, we'd sent forward with a delegation to, uh, before we arrived as a, an advance party, greets me in the lobby and he says, uh, he's got a bag in his hand, he says, I must tell you an amazing event today. I get called that there's somebody there who has something for Senator Lieberman, so I go out into the square, the tanks separate, and this young man with a black hat and a beard and a black coat comes in and I think, oh my God, I hope the German police has checked it. This could be a terrorist. So I, I apologize if I frisked him. He was clean. He gives it, I have to look in the bag. I look in the bag. Senator, there's three breads and some kosher wine and some meat. So I, I think I know who this came from. And so I, uh, after Shabbos, I called uh, Rabbi Diskin, the shaliach there, and uh, I said, you know, I didn't call you ahead. I didn't think about it. How did you know? I was here. Oh, see, this is, I, I've often said, the internet was created for Chabad. <laughs> the Rebbe said that, actually, in a way. But so he said, well, here's what happened. Uh, Rabbi Darren visited your mother in Stanford, Connecticut last night and asked about you. And she said, oh, Joseph is going to a conference in Munich. So um, Rabbi Darren immediately went home emailed me and told me that I had to bring you challah and wine and food for Shabbos. So this is the last story. I, I don't want too many of my stories to be about food, but during my uh, president, my vice presidential campaign, the Secret Service detail, which I had, they kept uh, the location of the hotels where we were staying um, secret uh, for security reasons. And I can't tell you the number of times I got to the hotel room and waiting for me there was a kosher meal from the local <laughs> shaliach. And uh, I reached the conclusion that high up in the U.S. Secret Service there was a Chabad shaliach. <laughs> so, oh, okay, so the first lesson for us from the Rebbe's life and teaching is love of our fellow Jews and a willingness to bring everybody in in a, in a, in a, a sort of more contemporary, problematic way. We don't want to have arguments among Jews. Uh, we don't want to argue about are you more or less this or that. You're, you're one of us, and we want to bring you, as the Rebbe said, mitzvah by mitzvah, more into Yiddishkeit. The second was the Rebbe was a great uh, uh, symbol and model for not as, as learned as he was, just not keeping Yiddishkeit and his learning in the base Madrash, but taking it out into the world. You know the Rebbe's life story. He was a genius uh, as a child, a so-called Ilui. He learned Talmud Torah early on. And then his family sent him to the University of Berlin, secular university, where he studied mathematics, physics, and uh, philosophy. Uh, and he continued this interest, as you know, in everything happening in the world around him. He was surprisingly uh, learned uh, in uh, everything happening in the world, science, technology, history, politics, government, the arts. Uh, it, it's why so many people in, uh, who were leaders in those various fields felt so interested in coming to talk to him and, and seeking advice, Jewish or uh, not Jewish. No area of human activity was irrelevant to the Rebbe or beneath him because he elevated it um, when he uh, dealt with it and uh, uh, spoke about it. Um, and he, this was in his life, really. He was an activist. Um, you know that during the darkest days of the Soviet Union, the Rebbe um, sent Shluchim covertly in to find Jews and keep that flame uh, alive. And afterward, when, when the Soviet Union collapsed, the number of uh, Shluchim in the Soviet Union, as we know today, the former Soviet Union in Ukraine, was enormous, responsible for the revival of Yiddishkeit there. There are some uh, people who are of the mind that so-called ultra-Orthodox Jews are not Zionists. The Rebbe was a Zionist. He believed in uh, Israel. He supported Israel. His shluchim are all around Israel. His picture, thank God, is all around 
uh, Israel, and he, he, was, he was intimately involved in giving counsel to great uh, leaders of, of Israel. So that's, I think, another lesson for us. Um, I remember when I was first elected to the state senate in Connecticut and uh, elected as majority leader, one of my friends who was active in the family of Dover Deitch, blessed, blessed memory, Josh Salmon. Yeah, was, was somebody going to clap for Dover Deitch? He was a <laughs>